Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak. It's, this is only my second time in Arkansas, and I'm really glad to be here for a less stressful reason than the last time. Uh, so I will mostly be talking about our coverage of the Mayflower spill. It's something we've been covering for the past six months, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. Uh, this screenshot is from our website from the first week of September, and during that week, the three most recent stories were all about Arkansas, as you can see. Uh, first, I'm going to explain a little bit about Inside Climate News. Uh, we're an independent, nonprofit news organization. We're uh, quite tiny. We have just eight full-time staff members, some freelancers, and an intern or two. So we publish three to four original stories a week, and we use the same reporting tools and methods and ethics as any traditional newsroom, but we're virtual. So none of us work in the same office. Uh, most of us work from home, and we do a lot of conference calls and use Google Docs to work together, and we rarely meet in person. So this is a photo from May, and it was our first and only full staff meeting. Um, we met in New York City, and in that photo, it's everyone on staff plus two interns and some regular freelancers. So this is from the mission statement at Inside Climate News, and our goal really is to fill the gaps left by traditional media. So there's been a lot of cutbacks in newsrooms recently, and often the environment and climate desks are just completely decimated. So because a lot of traditional media can't cover environmental issues in depth, uh, that's something we try to help with. And these are some of the different topics that we report on. This isn't all of them, just the top four on the site. We're able to report deeply about climate issues because that's all we do. We don't have to cover other um, aspects in the news. Um, a short story for me might take four days or five days. And that means I'm really lucky because a lot of regular newspaper reporters have to write one story a day or sometimes two or three stories a day. So that means we can go deeper and interview more people and hopefully write with more clarity and context than some of the other stories that are out there. Uh, so everyone on staff has their own area of expertise. Um, Maria Gallucci is our clean economy reporter, and so she writes a lot about wind energy and solar energy, um, different states' renewable energy mandates. Uh, Kat Bagley writes about the science and politics of climate change. Liz Douglas, who's in San Diego, writes about refineries and the financial side of the oil and gas industry. And then my Focus is mostly on pipeline safety and tar sands, but I'm starting to transition into more natural gas drilling. So the reason why we became so focused on the Arkansas spill is because we had a history of reporting on oil pipelines, and particularly pipelines carrying Canadian oil sands. And that became a focus of our reporting back in 2010. Uh, this was before I joined Inside Climate News, and Elizabeth McGowan, who was our DC reporter at the time, she was traveling around the country interviewing people in different states about energy issues ahead of the 2010 midterm elections. So in Nebraska, she met with ranchers and farmers who were concerned about the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. And the Keystone XL is the red line on the map um, and back then, the story wasn't a national story yet. It was just a local story about people worried that a spill from the pipeline would contaminate their groundwater. And since their livelihoods depend on the groundwater, they were very worried. So they kept asking her, what would happen if the oil got into my water supply? Where would it go? How fast would it move? And she couldn't answer them because we've only started using this type of oil in the last 15 or 20 years. So there's very little scientific research out there about it, and what research exists is mostly conducted by industry and proprietary and not something that the public has access to. So the oil comes from the oil sands region of Alberta, and it's the third largest uh, 
source of oil in the world. So it's a big business. Um, and it's different from the conventional oil wells that you see, you know, when you see a movie or something, they have a giant gusher of black oil. Uh, this isn't like that at all. It's these fields of black tarry stuff. It's oil mixed with sand and water and clay. This is what it looks like when you mine it out of the ground. And they extract the petroleum portion, which is called bitumen or bitumen. And that bitumen is so thick, you can hold it in your hands. It's a syrupy substance with the consistency of peanut butter. And that means they can't move it through a pipeline. So they dilute the bitumen with a cocktail of light chemicals called diluents. And then that mixture is called diluted bitumen or dilbit. So in 2011, when I joined Inside Climate News, the organization had decided that we were too small to cover every aspect of the climate um, debate. So they decided to focus on a few issues, and one of them was Canadian tar sands and pipelines. So I started reporting on the Keystone as well. And in November of 2011, uh, or October of 2011, I went to Nebraska, and the farmers and ranchers there started asking me the same questions they'd asked Elizabeth. What, what would happen if this oil got into my groundwater? And like her, I, I didn't have any answers for them. The research still wasn't out there. So we decided that since the research didn't exist, we would use the real world as a lab. And back in the summer of 2010, more than a million gallons of Dilbit spilled out of a pipeline in Michigan, and it contaminated 36 miles of the Kalamazoo River. Uh, and this pipeline was owned by a Canadian company called Enbridge. So we sent Elizabeth McGowan to Michigan, and she went uh, at the end of 2011, more than a year after the spill. And she is a veteran journalist who has a great ability to get people to talk to her and trust her. So she spoke with many, many people there from the EPA um, to employees at Enbridge. She talked with local residents and local officials. And a story started to emerge. And the key component of the story was that no one knew how to clean up this oil because it's different from conventional oil. Normally, when you have an oil spill, the oil is light enough to float on the surface of the water, so you can vacuum it off or skim it off, and the EPA knows how to deal with that. What happened here was, when the Dilbit spilled, the light chemicals all started to evaporate, or they dissolved. And then all you had left over was the bitumen, which was heavy enough to sink to the bottom of the river. And once that happens, you can't really clean it up because you can't see it, so you don't know where it is. And the EPA didn't know it was Dilbit for more than a week because Enbridge didn't tell them, and the Department of Transportation didn't know either. So at the beginning of this spill, the EPA thought, oh, it's a million gallons, we can clean it up in two months. Now it's been more than three years, and they're still cleaning it up, and it's cost more than a billion dollars. So. To give you some idea of how difficult it is, uh, Enbridge and the EPA had to improvise a way to clean up the oil. And one of the techniques they came up with was called poling, where they take wooden poles and sort of poke at the bottom of the river, and when oil floats up, they map the location of that sheen, and then they use the map to prioritize where to dredge for the oil. Um, and they discovered that clumps of the bitumen had formed little tar balls and were bouncing along the bottom of the river and uh, collecting in low areas and sometimes sinking deep into the sediment. So they actually take giant machines and have to scrape out the bottom of the river and it's the only way to get rid of that oil. Um, the lucky thing for you guys in Arkansas is the dill bit that spilled in Mayflower is a different brand than what spilled in Michigan and it's a lighter brand that floats more easily. So according to the EPA, none of that bitumen has sank to the bottom of the lake, but we won't know for sure until they conduct some sediment tests. So Elizabeth recognized that it was a very big story, what she discovered in Michigan, and she came back and talked with Susan White, the executive editor, and both of them had experience with long investigative stories, and they knew this had all the elements of a good story and it was an important one that needed to be told. 
So we put a lot of resources into it. Um, Elizabeth ultimately spent seven months on this story, almost full time, and I spent about three months mostly working on the science part of it. So our final four-part series combined the science and the personal stories of residents with uh, aspects of the cleanup and the flawed federal regulations that helped lead to the disaster. So one of the things we discovered is that Dilbit isn't regulated any differently than conventional oil, even though it behaves differently when it spills. Um, and I think part of what made the story work is it was written as a narrative. Elizabeth wrote it like you would write a novel, except everything there is true and everything is nonfiction. So you're following the residents along in their daily lives through the hours and, and days and months of the spill. And that aspect of the writing made it more readable. And we were hoping to reach a wider audience than just people who are already interested in science and environment stories. And once we decided to write it as a narrative, it meant it was a lot more work than a typical news story. So there were a lot of late night conference calls between Susan and Elizabeth and I. We spent hours on the phone. And towards the end, we would read the story aloud to each other several times. Because when you read, you get a sense for the flow of the story and the rhythm. And we wanted everything to be perfect. Uh, one of the resources that helped us a lot in our reporting was the National Transportation Safety Board. They launched an investigation of the spill right as it happened. And about a month before we published our series, they released 10,000 pages of their raw notes and interview transcripts. So we were able to go through those notes and pick out certain facts and put them in our story to add extra color. Um, for example, from their investigation, we learned that Enbridge had called, after they discovered the spill, Enbridge called its own PR department before they called the federal authorities to tell them about the spill. So that was you know, a couple sentences in the story to add color. And after, around the time we published our series, the NTSB came out with its own final report. And they identified a complete breakdown of safety at the company. And they also issued a series of recommendations to uh, FIMSA, which is the federal pipeline regulator, about how to improve its regulations and hopefully prevent a similar spill in the future. So after the initial series, uh, Elizabeth left Inside Climate. She was going to write a book that she'd been working on for a while. Um, and I kept going, uh, mostly reporting follow-up stories on pipeline safety and regulations and leak detection. And after a while, David Hasmeyer, one of our freelancers and a brilliant reporter, he joined us to write about Enbridge's construction of the new pipeline. So the company had decided to build a brand new pipeline next to the original one in Michigan. And this one had twice the capacity of the original pipeline. And as they were doing the construction, they ran into tensions with local landowners. So a lot of landowners were complaining that they were being bullied by Enbridge representatives. Um, many of them didn't like how the construction was going on their land. They were surrounded by loud equipment 24-7. One family was told the pipeline route would cut through their swimming pool, so they had to dig out their swimming pool. Another family would lose part of its back porch. And some other families, uh, the trench was being dug so close to the side of their home that Enbridge had to shore up the foundations of their house to prevent it from collapsing into the trench. So things like this were going on. And these landowners would go to their local or state representatives, and those people couldn't really do anything to help them. And some of them weren't willing or didn't seem to care. And part of the problem is pipeline safety is almost all regulated by the federal regulator, FIMSA. But FIMSA has no control over where a pipeline is placed. So they don't control the location of a pipeline route. And they say, that is up to local authorities. But local authorities will say, FIMSA controls pipeline safety, so we have no control here. And that means for the local residents, they don't know who to turn to. So David has been writing a lot about that and continues to do so. And we were still writing follow-up stories about Michigan and Keystone when the Arkansas spill happened on March 29th. Uh, this is a still from a 
YouTube video taken by a resident on the day of the spill. And the spill was discovered when black oil bubbled out of the ground between two homes in Mayflower. And this was a neighborhood with nice brick homes. It was a neighborhood with a lot of families with young kids. And the oil ran down the street and into the gutter. And then it went into a local creek and eventually into Lake Conway, which is a major uh, fishing area for, for Mayflower. And then the city officials uh, reacted pretty quickly. They, dumped, they took their road crews and dumped a bunch of gravel and fill into the lake. And their hope was to dam up part of the lake so the oil would be kept in one corner of the lake and not contaminate the rest of the lake. And we won't know for sure if that was successful until they get the sediment test results back. And I think those results are due out later this month. So I didn't know about the spill when it happened on a Friday afternoon. But the next morning, the Inside Climate News publisher called me and said, hey, there's been a spill. You should find out if it's Canadian oil. So I called Exxon. And they told me the brand name of the oil, which was Wabasca Heavy. And I knew from my previous reporting that Wabasca Heavy is a type of dill bit. And this uh, box is a screenshot from uh, crudemonitor.ca, which is an industry website that tracks basic uh, chemical properties of different types of Canadian oil. So you notice Wabasca Heavy is under the heavy sour dill bit category. So I wrote a story about that, and it immediately became part of the larger debate on Keystone, because we know that Dilbit is one of the types of oils that would flow through the Keystone XL. So then I was sent to Arkansas to do on-the-ground reporting, and I arrived on a Monday, four days after the spill, and I noticed two things. One was the town smelled horrible. Um, the, the stench of oil in certain parts of town, it, it smelled like a gas station combined with burning tires and burning trash, and it, it, I, I knew it wasn't good for you health-wise. But the scary thing was after a while you stopped noticing the smell, so you kind of get used to it and stop being able to smell it, which was kind of scary. And then the other thing I noticed was all the answers were coming from Exxon. So the EPA was supposedly in charge of the spill cleanup, and people from the EPA and PHMSA and Exxon were in a central command center. And this was a warehouse they'd rented on the side of town, but the phone number for the command center went to an Exxon company line. And then the daily press releases given to journalists were all sent out by Exxon representatives. And people from the EPA and the Department of Transportation didn't return my calls or emails for interviews. The press were not allowed in the command center, and they had a security guard at the gate of the parking lot preventing anyone from entering. And I, the first few days there, I went back to the command center basically twice a day, hoping they would change their mind. Um, and every time I would ask to talk to someone from the government, and occasionally they would send my message inside, but it was someone from Exxon who always came out. And they refused to put me in touch with people from the government. So I wrote a story about that, saying how you know, there was tight security and Exxon was running the show. And then I wrote a story with people who were willing to talk to me, and these were the residents. I was invited to a local church dinner held for the 22 evacuated families. And they were willing to tell me their stories about the chaos of going home and finding that your neighborhood was locked off and you had to throw your possessions in the car and go to a hotel for who knows how long. Um, and the funny thing was, as I was asking them about their experiences, they were asking me questions. They wanted to know what were the chemicals in the oil, what were the health effects. They wanted to know about the Michigan spill and Keystone XL. So they were frustrated that local officials weren't giving them the answers they needed. And they were starting to educate and inform themselves. They were questioning reporters. They were going online and sending each other news clips and forming groups on Facebook. Um, so those were all the types of things they were doing to try and understand what had just happened to them. And on uh, Wednesday, a few days after I arrived, I went back to the command center. And this time, there was a new security guard who, for some reason, let me in. So I went in and headed to the public affairs desk to ask for EPA phone numbers. 
but I didn't get very far before people from Exxon came over and said, you have to leave now or we'll arrest you for criminal trespassing. So I left and called my editor and then she wrote a story about it because it was a story. And we discovered later that on that same day, um, there were a group of other reporters on the other side of town and they were following the Arkansas Attorney General as he was visiting the spill site with his investigators. And they had been told they could enter the neighborhood if they followed him at a distance. So that's what they did. And within 90 seconds, local law enforcement came over and said, actually, you can't be here. You need to leave now or we're going to arrest you because Exxon doesn't want you here. So it was happening all over town. And also the FAA imposed a no-fly zone over the town. And the person in charge of that, according to his LinkedIn profile, had some connection with Exxon. So these were all the types of things that were happening during the first week. And then when I went back to Boston, uh, everyone at Inside Climate pitched in and we kept reporting on Arkansas. For about two weeks, it's all we wrote about. So Kat Bagley, got a copy of the Mayflower police transcripts and she discovered all kinds of discrepancies between when Exxon had said they discovered the spill and what was shown in the police transcripts. So she wrote about all of the unanswered questions on the timeline. And then Exxon also started insisting that Wabasca Heavy was not Dilbit, that it was just heavy oil. So Maria Gallucci, dug into that and discovered it comes from a bitumen deposit, it's diluted, and it competes in the Dilbit market. So yes, it is Dilbit. Um, and around this time in the middle of April, we got the Pulitzer for our Dilbit disaster series, which was crazy. And one of the really nice things is I got to meet the other reporters and editor. Um, <laughs> at the ceremony was the first time the four of us were in a room together at the same time, so. Um, and then it also allowed us, because more people knew about us and were aware of our reporting, it allowed us to uh, launch a crowdfunding campaign. We teamed up with the Arkansas Times to dedicate some reporters full time to this story. So uh, we raised more than $25,000 in three weeks and the two reporters on it were Elizabeth McGowan, who was freelancing for us, and Sam Eifling, who's a freelancer who is from Arkansas but now lives in Canada. Yeah. And the idea was uh, the reporter for the Arkansas Times would focus on the local angle and our reporter would write about more of the national implications. So that partnership started uh, over the summer and before then we continued to report on the spill from every angle we could think of. So Maria Gallucci wrote about a very personal story about one of the families. They had four kids and they went from their five bedroom house to living in two hotel rooms. And when that got to be too much, Exxon paid for an apartment. But after a while, they were kicked out of the apartment because the neighbors said the kids were too loud. So now they're living in a trailer and just you know not knowing what's gonna happen to them next. And one day, the family dog um, got into a puddle with some oil in it, and something happened to the dog. It was either his back legs were paralyzed or he had a stroke, and the family was just glad it wasn't one of the kids. So these were the types of things happening to the families. And I started writing a lot about the health angle. Um, we know in every oil spill that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different chemicals that are released into the air and none of these are good for you, but it's hard to say for each individual person what levels are safe. And what happened was the Arkansas Department of Health would say, you know, from our air monitoring, we believe the levels are safe and you should all be fine. But meanwhile, dozens of residents were having chronic health problems. They had weird rashes and nosebleeds, vomiting, nausea, headaches. There were kids who had trouble breathing. So their personal experiences were all very different from what they were being told they should be feeling. And that was a big problem. And there are also gaps in the science and regulation that make it very difficult. So for example, after an oil spill, we don't have federal regulations about who should be evacuated 
and when they should be evacuated and how to assess that. So every time it happens, the local authorities have to use their best judgment in the heat of the moment and figure it out. So in Arkansas, the officials decided to evacuate 22 families in one neighborhood, but people other in, on the other side of the neighborhood or people who lived in an adjacent neighborhood were not evacuated. And no one ever actually knocked on their doors or called them to check in on them. They, they only found out about the spill when they saw the police cars and saw the stuff running across the ground and smelled the fumes. And people across town who lived next to the lake where all the oil was, they also were not evacuated. And that's something that Sam Eifling wrote about when he started working on our collaboration. He interviewed families who were not part of the 22 homes, who said they felt neglected, they had concerns that were not being treated, and they felt that they were being treated differently just because they weren't part of that 22 group of homes. And then we also covered the technical aspects of the pipeline. So a lot of technical reports were coming out about the maintenance history of the Pegasus line, but all of them were being kept from the public uh, for, for a long time at least. And Exxon at certain points asked FIMSA to keep certain documents private in order not to reveal trade secrets. So we wrote about that. And at one point we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for Exxon's emergency response plan and this is what came back. <laughs> uh, we got a useless redacted map hundreds of pages that were completely black and they got a little happy with the redactions because they decided to redact part of the Exxon mobile logo but not all of it and, and <laughs> you can still tell what it says and this was on the bottom of every page uh, so that was interesting and then Liz Douglas kept going with the metallurgy aspect of the reports um, some of the documents started to become public and one thing she found out was there were known flaws in the pipeline and Exxon knew about some of them and they were problems that could have been managed if the pipeline was operated and maintained properly. But that was not done and as a result there was a spill. This uh, is something that just came out recently from the Arkansas Times collaboration. The reporters put together a map of the entire pipeline route across Arkansas and they drove up and down all of it and interviewed many, many people along the route. Um, they interviewed business owners and residents and families, teachers, local officials. Some of the people were not too worried. Others were very concerned and didn't know until the reporters talked to them that they live next to the same pipeline that had broken in Mayflower. So this was a really big feature story that ran on our site and the Arkansas Times. And then Elizabeth has also reported on the Central Water, Arkansas Water District's attempt to get Exxon to move part of the pipeline. About um, 13 miles of the pipeline goes through the watershed that provides your drinking water. So. The utility is worried and has tried for months to negotiate and get Exxon to move it. And just today, um, they filed intent to sue Exxon. They gave them 60 days notice because, as they said, the negotiations have not been going well. Um, the utility said there have been repeated unfulfilled requests to get comprehensive, unredacted information on the pipeline, and Exxon has not responded well. So we may see a lawsuit within the next 60 days. And a theme that runs through all of our reporting is the importance of regulation and the role of FIMSA. For most of the states in the country, uh, states often have their own regulators when it comes to the safety of natural gas lines. But when it's about oil pipelines that cross state borders, everything is ruled by FIMSA. And that means they're the one place that can impose regulations and, and safety on operators. But one of our freelancers attended a meeting recently where FIMSA officials and industry people were gathered and FIMSA's top regulator stood up and said our regulatory process is kind of dying, we have few tools to work with and we need industry to regulate itself. So this is not encouraging and at one point 
Jeff Weiss, who's the um, head of pipeline safety there, said he was starting a YouTube channel to persuade industry to voluntarily improve safety. So they're turning to YouTube because they're understaffed and underfunded. And this was another telling quote from him, basically saying FIMSA doesn't have the capability of imposing fines that are serious enough to get bad operators to change their behavior. And this is uh, basically the end of my talk, but I don't want you to get the impression we only report on pipelines. So here are some of the other big projects we're working on, and hopefully these will come out within the next few months. One of them is more of an analysis piece about national energy policy and debates, and it will mention the Keystone, but it's about much more than that. A second project from Kat and Maria is about New York City and its plans to adapt to climate change and sea level rise and what that says about the rest of the country. And then I'm working on a project related to oil and gas drilling and air quality in Texas. And finally, one of our freelancers is writing about some recent polar bear attacks. Uh, these are polar bears attacking people in Canada and what that says about climate change and ecology. So that's the end of my talk and I'll take any questions you have. Sure, thank you. All right, we, uh, we have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get the, uh, the microphone to you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for speaking here this morning. Uh, ironically, it was almost exactly four years ago in this very room that the company that was hired to develop a land use plan and zoning code for the Lake Maumelle watershed had a map sitting almost where I'm, or standing on an easel almost where I'm sitting, and it, for the first time, it showed the pipeline, Pegasus pipeline, crossing the Lake Maumelle watershed and, and how close it was. And since, since that happened, Central Arkansas Water has been pressuring ExxonMobil to do a number of things. You, you mentioned moving the pipeline out of the watershed, but also emergency preparedness. And so over these years, Central Arkansas Water and ExxonMobil have been developing this emergency preparedness, uh, putting booms on the north shore of the lake and so forth. One thing you may not know is that during this entire process, you mentioned earlier that the Dale bit has components, part of which sinks and part of which vaporizes. ExxonMobil, during all this emergency preparedness, never bothered to inform Central Arkansas Water that the, that the product that was flowing through the pipeline that they were preparing for in an emergency was not the product that was actually going through there. They've been preparing for light, sweet crude that floats, as you say. ExxonMobil never bothered to inform our water company that a different product was going through there, and you'd, you needed different emergency preparedness procedures and so forth and tactics. That's how unreliable ExxonMobil is as a partner in this whole adventure. Well, I, I just want to say that's part of, um, that's a FIMSA regulation problem as well, because when a company has a pipeline, they're required to report if it carries crude oil or gasoline or jet fuel, but they're not required to report what particular type of crude oil it is. And if they were forced to do that, then during the Michigan spill, for example, they would have known they were dealing with heavy oil and they would have been better prepared. Questions? Yes, sir. Come to the microphone. Thank you for coming. Um, can you tell us anything about the cold lake leaks? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know too much about that. So the cold lake leaks are an area in Alberta that mine is mining for bitumen, and these are underground mines that have been leaking for months now, and they don't know how it started, and they don't know how to stop it. Um, what I can say is there are two ways that they mine for bitumen in Canada. One is surface mining, where it just looks like a big black pit, and they dig it out of the ground and process it. The other type of mining is subsurface mining, because you have oil sands deposits deep underground, and they can't dig down that deep, so they basically inject steam underground and boil the earth, and the bitumen comes flowing out. So these are you know, the big underground operations, and during 
I guess starting a few months ago, something went wrong in that process, and the bitumen has just been leaking underground in a place that's very difficult to access, and they don't know how to stop it. And people didn't even know it was going on until a company employee became a whistleblower and told the press. So it's not something we've been covering yet. Um, I know they're having trouble cleaning it up, and it reminds me of the BP Gulf spill, where you go deep enough and it's really hard to fix anything when something wrong happens. Yes, Kristen. Hi, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, your background and the staff's background as far as uh, their experience um, with science before they be became on the staff there. Um, what type of background did they all come from? Many different backgrounds. Um, uh, I have a background in environmental science and earth sciences. Um, Kat Bagley got a double degree at Columbia University. They used to have a degree, it was a master's of journalism plus a master's in environmental science. So she has that double degree. Um, for many others, let's see, I'm not too sure. I know many of them have been reporting for many years, so they just learn on the job as these things come up. I, I know that because I have a science background, it's been easier for me to report on certain things, such as the health aspects um, and the chemistry of the oil. And I've often said it's the only time I'm grateful I suffered through organic chemistry, because it's finally <laughs> useful. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. You're up, Emily. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Weed. I'm in class nine at the Clinton School. Um, Every oil spill I've ever read about, it seems like the cleanup is super dramatic and everything goes wrong and it's just a mess. And I'm wondering, what is a best case scenario oil spill cleanup? What does that involve? What are kind of the key components of taking care of it? Gosh, I don't know. I, I assume you clean it up as quickly as you can and compensate people well. Um, I think every spill it depends on the size of the spill and, and what, what is involved. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that. Got time for one more question. Here it is right here. Thank you for coming today. There's been a great deal in the news about the people who live in the area, about whether to stay, whether to move. Uh, I was wondering your opinion about the safety of I, the people who live here. I mean, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that. It's, it's, very hard to under, it's very hard to measure the health and safety because every person is different. So you could have two people living in one house and they could both be exposed to the same level of chemicals and 20 years from now one of them could have cancer and the other one be perfectly healthy. So that's, that's one of the difficulties that regulators run into is how do you keep people safe if everyone reacts differently. Um, so I think it's every family's personal decision. I know there's, I've heard there's one family of the 22 homes who doesn't think there's a problem at all and is eager to move back into his house. He might already be there. Um, others, many others have said they'll never return to the home. They, they want them sold to Exxon and want to move elsewhere. What? That's okay. We're okay. Um, Canadian regulations are mm, not much better than ours, if at all. They, they have been dealing with Dilbit for longer, but they also have problems with regulation and pipeline safety. Let's, uh, let's give Lisa Song a round of applause. Thank you for being here.